Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight once again. We thank you because this is the backbone of every believer and is the foundation of the church on which the whole programs are built. Therefore, Lord, we pray that as we come together today, you help us so that every one of us present here will not be present only in body, but in soul and spirit, and in mind and attitude in Jesus' name. We're praying that your mighty spirit will be present with us, and that you take us into your word, and that the author of the scriptures will be the teacher that will teach us tonight in Jesus' name. We're praying, Lord, that will pass beyond the vessel of clay, so that your spirit himself will teach us what we ought to know that will strengthen us, that will establish us in the truth of the word of God, the timeless truth in Jesus' name. And we pray that as we learn and study, we'll come better in our Christian lives, more solid in our Christian conviction, and we'll have deeper, higher understanding in the ways of the Lord in Jesus' name. We pray that our coming here tonight will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Lead us into the truth, that through the truth, we might be totally, completely set free. In Jesus' name, we pray. I welcome every one of you to our Bible study tonight. As you know, we study the Word of God here, a line upon line and precept upon precept. And it is the very backbone of the church. And anything that tampers with your study of the Bible, tampers with the very center of your Christian life. And anything that tampers with the Bible study in the church here, tampers with the very foundation on which the whole church is built. And not many churches do what we do. Just going from chapter to chapter, very slowly but certainly, wanting to know and wanting to gather together all the things that the Lord has given us. It's like uh, when Ruth got to the land of Canaan, coming from the land of Moab, and she came there, she got there at the time of the harvest. And then Naomi said, why don't you go out and glean for yourself and find something to nourish us. Thinking about where they were coming from, no nourishment at all. Then we're told that Ruth went out and began to glean. And she came back and uh, her container was full of the which she had gleaned. Harvest time. For those of you who are coming here for the first time, this happens to be harvest time. When we're gleaning from the word of God, gathering from the word of God, and what you gather from the word of God will nourish your soul, will strengthen you, will empower you, so that you'll be able to face the challenges of life. Because without the word of God, you will not be able to face the challenges that you face now and the challenges that will come later. And by the way, we go from chapter to chapter and verse to verse because we believe that all scripture is given by inspiration. That's why we do not omit anything. And uh, some of you that have been here during this time, we're having a Bible readings in the uh, First Chronicles. As you find that it says, uh, you know, this one begat this one, this one begat that one. Maybe in your mind you are thinking, why doesn't the church omit that? Uh, what have we got to do with all these names and names and names? We don't omit anything because every jot and every title in the world is inspired. And God has something for us in every page of scripture. That's why you find us just doggedly going on, steadfastly going on, without omitting anything. Turn with me your Bible to Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. Matthew chapter 4 verse 4. And he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Notice it doesn't say that man shall not live by bread. It says man shall not live by bread alone. The Lord understands and realizes we need the bread for a physical body. And we take that bread for a physical body so regularly. But it says not by bread only. Not by bread alone. Because you are not just body. You are body, spirit and soul. And as you nourish your body, very regularly and daily and frequently so, you need to nourish your soul regularly and frequently too. And it says, we will live by 
every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And all these words coming out of the mouth of God, uh, they nourish us. That's why we're going verse after verse and chapter after chapter. I pray that as you come tonight, your soul will be nourished in Jesus' name. We're now in First Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4. We're looking at it from verse 1 now to verse 6. For as much then, as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, ye and am yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin that he no longer shall leave the rest of his time in the flesh to the loss of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, lost, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For, for this cause, was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Those are the verses we're looking at today. As I've told you a number of times, when if you have been coming for the Bible study regularly, Peter the Apostle here was writing to Christians who are suffering. They were suffering persecution as a result of their faith in the Lord. And he needed to teach them, he needed to exhort them, he needed to instruct them on how they will live according to the will of God in a hostile world. The epistle speaks much about suffering. Christ suffering on the one hand and our own suffering on the other hand. If you read the epistle, just even reading through alone, you cannot miss the emphasis of the epistle. Please go with me in First Peter chapter 1, reading there from verse 11. Searching what, or what manner of time, the Spirit of Christ, which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that shall follow. You see, he told them from the uh, first chapter he was mindful of their suffering. But then they should understand they were not the only ones suffering. In fact, there was a reason why they were suffering. They were following after the footsteps of Jesus Christ because Christ also suffered. And then in chapter 2, here he told them about their own suffering and about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. In chapter 2 verse 19, for this is thankworthy. If for conscience toward God, you endure grief, suffering wrongfully. And then he tells them in verse 21, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps. In chapter 3 verse 17, for it is better. If the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also has once suffered for sins. He tells us we are suffering. And he tells us Christ also has suffered. In chapter 4, reading there in verse 13, but rejoicing as much. As ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad with exceeding joy. And then in chapter 5, there he tells us the purpose and the end result of uh, the, the suffering. Chapter 5 verse 10, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that he has suffered for a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and say to you. So you understand then that uh, as you go through every chapter, he mentions suffering. Because uh, many were suffering for righteousness sake, and they needed encouragement so that they will still be hopeful and they needed an exhortation so that they will be steadfast in their faith. Of course, Peter knew as an apostle as well as a pastor that some of the people were suffering because of evil doing. And he had a word of warning for them because of the coming judgment. As we look at uh, what we're looking at, suffering in our identification with the suffering of Christ. Believers are in education with Christ's suffering. 
There are three things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, the past. Maybe when you became a Christian, you suffered. And you're still looking back and the suffering is lingering in your mind. And you can't understand how you could suffer so much. Number one is to explain your experience of the past. To explain your experience of the past. Number two, in the present time now, maybe you are suffering and you are going through a persecution. And you are wondering why the fire is burning. The trial is there. It may be in the place of work. It may be in your home. It may be in your community. It may be among even people you have done good to. And you are wondering why. Number two, it's to edify you in your present experience of persecution. In the past, it's to explain what happened to you. Why it happened to you. In the present, it is to edify you so that you'll be challenged and edified and fortified that whatever may be happening now, God knows all about it. Number three, it may be that you have not suffered much in the past. You are not suffering yet now in the, in the present. But in the future, who knows? Persecution may come. Trial may come. It is number three to equip you for the experience you may have in the future. Is to explain the past, is to edify you in the present, is to equip you for the future. So that's why believers today, if you are suffering persecution because of your faith in Christ, you need to know in the scriptures how you are able, how you will be able to survive spiritually, and how you will still function properly in the hostile community around you. That means then you accept the Lordship of Christ. You adopt the mind of Christ and you identify with him in all things. And as you do that, you identify with him. You are able to experience the power of his resurrection as well as enjoy the privilege of his fellowship and continual presence. We're looking at three points in our study today. Number one, the power of identification with Christ. The power of identification with Christ. Number two, purity through identification with Christ. Purity through identification with Christ. Number three is the peril of identification of the Christless. Those who do not have Christ, they do not know Christ. If you identify with them and you live the way they live, there's a peril, there's a danger, there's a punishment that follows after that, number one is the power of identification with Christ. Please come to First Peter chapter one, chapter four, verse one. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Here he talks about the suffering of Christ. First of all, you need to understand, if you are going to identify with Christ, how are you identifying with Christ? The fact is, from the birth of Jesus. Have you thought about it? The conception of Jesus, yeah, there was a problem for Mary. And it was, you know, the trauma and the suffering that uh, Joseph almost put her away. And then Jesus Christ was born, and Herod was after him. Do you think about that suffering? From conception to the birth. And then as he was growing up, the suffering still continued. He started his earthly ministry. They were to push him over the cliff, still suffering. And then eventually the betrayal, eventually the death, eventually the burial. And then on the third day he rose from the dead. But you need to understand, from cradle to the grave, it was suffering all through. And the climax of the suffering, the height of the suffering was when he was hanging on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it says now, you want to arm yourself with the same mind of Christ. He suffered and so are you going to suffer? The Bible talks about the suffering of Christ in so many passages. Look at uh, First Peter chapter 2, reading there in verse 21. For even here unto what ye called, because Christ also suffered for us. Underline those two words, suffered for us. Oh yes, he suffered because of sin, but not, not because of his own sin, because of our sin. He was our sin bearer. He was a substitute. And because he replaced us, he suffered. The suffering that should have come upon us, the penalty, the punishment that should have come upon us, came upon him. Christ also suffered, but he suffered for us. And because he suffered for us, 
Why will you pull your hand? Why will you shrug your shoulder? Why will you pull back? Why will you run away as far as possible from the suffering? He did it for you already. He has carried already the heavier part of the of the sin, of the load. Therefore, the line say you have now is referred to as light affliction. And as you suffer persecution for his sake, you identify with him. In Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 8, rather. Romans chapter 8, from verse 17. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heir with Christ. Listen to this. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified also together. It says, if we suffer with him, if we identify with him, and what he went through, we go through. You know how to do that? Very simple. Live in the world like he lived in the world. Put your feet where he put his feet. Act the way he acted. Say what he said. Do what he did. Live the way he lived. And what the world did, to, the world has not changed. If the world has not changed, if Christ were here today, and he did exactly what he did at that time, the people of the world will still do what they did at that time to him. And because he has not changed, and the world has not changed, and Christianity has not changed, and Bible standard has not changed, if you will leave that same standard, and you will do what he did, and say what he said, and go where he went, and act the way he acted, and live a holy life the way he lived, live a righteous life the way he lived, if you will just do exactly what he did, the world will do to you what he did unto him. That's why it says, if we suffer with him, then we'll be glorified together with him in verse 19, in verse 18 rather. It says, for I reckon that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. He suffered for just a few years and he suffered for just a few hours on the cross. But now, the glory that has followed has been for years and years and years and years. And the glory that followed has totally overshined and has totally, uh, completely uh, been greater than the suffering that he went through. If that is so, then it means that whatever suffering you are going through is nothing. It's just a light affliction. And then the glory that will follow will be much, much greater than what you may see today. In Second Corinthians chapter 1. Second Corinthians chapter 1. There we still see about uh, the suffering and we're still being encouraged in scripture that even though you may be in a hostile world, live in holiness. That is your hope. It's the holiness of life in a hostile environment that gives hope to the believer. It says in that Second Corinthians chapter 1 verse 7, And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, ye are partakers of the sufferings, it says, So shall ye be also of the consolation. But you will not get the consolation without the suffering. If you want consolation, the consolation of the Lord, the comfort and the consolation of the Spirit of God, then you must go through the suffering because it is from suffering to the consolation. Not consolation before the suffering. It means then you are going to live for Christ. There are many people that say, I, I don't understand this thing they are talking about. They talk about suffering, but I don't know about this suffering they are talking about. And I'm a Christian. Maybe you, you think you are a Christian. And you are not a Christian. Because if you are a real Christian, and you are living in the world, the world will never be friendly with true Christianity. And with the true Christian, if you really live the life of Christ, and you are demonstrating the light, why in the darkness of the world, the darkness of the world, they hate the light. They hate holiness. They hate righteousness. They are going to put some persecution on you. And it doesn't even matter how long you have been a Christian. You might have been a Christian for a few years or for many years. You might be just a member of the church or a worker in the church or a leader in the church. Persecution suffering will definitely come. And that was the example. And that was the testimony of all the people that went before us. In Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Philippians chapter 3 verse 10. Here Paul the apostle said that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and fellowship of his suffering. That I may know him. You cannot know Christ uh, without going through some suffering. There are many people that are praying, Oh Lord, uh, give me your power. Give me your spirit. And give me this and give me that. Do you recognize the result or uh, the thing you are praying for? Because if God actually gave you what you wanted, you want success, 
You want power? You want authority? You want to be useful? You want to be profitable in the kingdom? You want this and you want that? You say, I want to shine like this and like that. Go back to Bible history. All the people that shone, that shone more than all the other people, suffering came. And even Jesus Christ, uh, that is the Savior of the Lord, the Prince of Peace, he also suffered. Have you thought, have you forgotten about Joseph? The Lord elevated him, exalted him, suffering came also. Have you, have you forgotten Moses? The Lord gave his spine to that man's life. Suffering also came. Have you forgotten about David? He was anointed to be king and was elevated above all the children of his parents. Suffering came. Have you forgotten about Daniel? That man that had visions and dreams and the gifts and the power of the Spirit of God. Suffering also came. Have you forgotten Paul? Paul the apostle. He said his conversion was not ordinary. He was going on the way to Damascus and the Lord met him. Not only that, he saw the Lord himself. And then he was taken to the third heaven. Then he said, because of the revelation that was given unto me, there was also given unto me a son in the flesh, a messenger of the devil, to perfect me. And he said, the thing was even too much for me. I went to the Lord and three times asking him, O oh Lord, will not you take this away? And he said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. And therefore will I rejoice in my reproaches and my tribulation and all my problems. The point is, if you are praying, oh God, exalt me. Oh God, elevate me. Oh God, do this for me. Make me to shine more than the other fellow. Now you understand, the more you shine and the more the power of God is in your life, the more you are going to have the persecution. You cannot have one without the other. That's why, look at that verse 10, Philippians chapter 3. That I may know him. He had known him already. He wanted to know him more. And then that I may know the power of his resurrection. If you want to know more of the power of the resurrection, get ready. The fellowship of his suffering. And to be made conformable unto his death. And therefore you find that as we look at the Bible, the word of God, the higher you go, the, the more suffering you are likely to have, the more persecution you are likely to have. You have a choice. It's either to say, Lord, I don't want to suffer. Leave me in the valley where I am. Where my life will mean nothing. Where my life will not result into the gathering of souls into the kingdom. I remain in the valley because I don't want suffering. But if you want the challenge of the power of the Lord and the challenge of ministry, Lord, lead me higher. Lord, make me to know the power of your resurrection. I know that uh, I'll then be made conformable unto your death and there'll be the fellowship of your suffering. You are ready for both sides, but actually there's nothing to it because in the suffering, in the trial and the tribulation, the Lord says, my grace is sufficient for you. Therefore, you don't need to fear anything. Just pray and consecrate yourself, but identify with Christ in his suffering. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading verses 11 and 12. Let me just read verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 2, reading from, okay, from verse 11. It says, it's a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, identification with Christ, dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. When we suffer with him, it is then we'll be able to reign with him. Come back to First Peter, First Peter chapter 4, reading there in verse 1. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, I told you he suffered for us. Is substitutionary suffering. Is uh, he took our place? Then it says, "Arm yourselves." Likewise, with the same mind. It says, "The mind that Christ had, that's the same mind you are to have. Put on the same mind. Make that mind of Christ like an armor that you put on." What mind did Jesus have in his suffering? There are two areas, or there are two sides to the mind. Number one. He looked beneath a suffering to see the Father's plan. He looked beneath a suffering to see the Father's plan. But he didn't stop there. Number two, he looked beyond a suffering to see the Father's purpose. And if you will do that in your life, anytime little suffering or great suffering, no matter what, comes to you, you look beneath the suffering. And you look at the Father's plan. You say, this will not come to me without passing through the Father's hand. 
Yeast will not come to me without it fitting into the overall broad plan of the Almighty God for me. If God has allowed this, something you could have stopped, something you could have removed. If God has allowed this, there is a purpose. And therefore, you look at, you look beneath it. You don't just look at the suffering, uh, see what I'm suffering, see what I'm going through, see my family situation, see it in the place of work, see how everybody hates me. In fact, I don't know what I'll do again. Maybe I'll not do good to anybody anymore. All the people I did good to, see what they have done for me. Don't, don't talk like that. Don't look at the suffering, just at the suffering. Look beneath it and see the Father's plan. And then look beyond it. Don't limit yourself to the suffering. Don't just look down. Don't just be looking limited, focusing on the suffering. You look beyond that suffering so that you can see the Father's purpose. And then the Apostle said, if you are going to go through your suffering, that's exactly what you are going to do. That's the attitude you are going to have. That's the mind you are going to put on. You arm yourself with the same mind. And then it tells us this uh, wonderful uh, part of the verse in verse 1. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. You understand that? He that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Actually that word cease in the original means to be released from sin. Released. What does that mean? It means that, uh, you know, when you have suffered in a particular place, when you have suffered, it makes you to know the value of those of the community there. Maybe when you got into the community, you were so entranced and you were so happy with that community and you were almost replacing that community with the Almighty God. You think they love you and you love them and everything is all right and they are taking away your heart from the Lord. But then those people, they begin to cause you to suffer. And as they cause you to suffer, it makes you withdraw from them. It makes it drives you to the Bible. It drives you on your knees. It drives you to victorious life. And they are watching you. They are watching you from behind. They are watching you from the front. They are watching you in the day. They are watching you in the night. It makes you to live a careful life. A righteous life. A holy life. That's what it says. When you suffer, then you know that this place is not your home. Then you know that this place is not a friendly territory. You know that this is a hostile environment. Therefore, you are careful the way you live. You say, I will not allow them to have any reason to say, uh -huh, this is why we are punishing him. This is why we are doing this. It means then you are released from sin. It wins you from the world. It releases you from the world. It makes you to be the light of the world and to live the life that you ought to live. It makes you, in the language of Romans chapter 6, dead to sin. Dead to sin. You actually withdraw from the world more and more as the worldly people are persecuting you. It's when the Egyptians, when they persecuted the children of Israel, that those Egyptians remembered there is a land of Canaan. And they, they were weaned from the world that is uh, from Egypt. And the milk of Egypt they were not retested anymore. They wanted to go to the land of promise. In Romans chapter 6, reading there from verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And then it says in verse 7, For he that is dead is freed from sin. In verse 11, Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Well, we have learned something here. That uh, when you suffer in the world, and you suffer persecution, and you suffer with Christ, it makes you then to be weaned from the world. It makes you to live a righteous life. It makes you to examine the Bible more thoroughly. It makes you to look at, the, at your life, and then put things in shape so that you will not be suffering for sin. We go to point number two. Purity through identification with Christ. Purity through identification with Christ. We're looking at him from verse 2 now. That he no longer live, shall live the rest of his life in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. You must make a connection between verse 2 and verse 1. You have suffered in the flesh. You have identified with Christ. Your sins are forgiven. Your life is changed. And you have ceased from sin. 
And then the meaning of that is that you no longer live the rest of your life now after the flesh in the lusts of men. But now your life is totally, completely, entirely dedicated to doing the will of God. For the time past, in verse 3, of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we watch in lasciviousness and loss and excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. And the first thing I want you to notice here is uh, that Peter the Apostle, he mentioned very clearly, item by item, the low base attitude and character that sinners have that Christians should not have. If you look at verse 3, it mentions lasciviousness. That's talking about a terrible kind of uh, indecency or terrible kind of uh, misbehavior that will even shock the people of the world. And then it talks about lust, that is uh, evil desires, sinful desires and sinful passions. It talks about excess of wine. The original uh, language talks about, you know, just bubbling and bubbling. Which means something that these people take and then they are intoxicated and they are bubbling and just talking and talking uh, without uh, any sense. And then talks about revelings. Uh, those, uh, that reveling is referring to the noisy celebrations and the wild parties with immoral activities that people have. And then banquetings. That is, a drinking parties and festivities resulting in intoxication and loss of senses. Then abominable idolatries, making pleasure a God, making money a God, or making career uh, the thing that replaces God in your life, or a man, or a woman, or even your children, or maybe traditional religion replaces the true God that becomes idolatry. And it, it calls it abominable idolatry. And then it doesn't even stop there. It talks about excess of riot. And it talks about evil speaking. But the point I want to make is this uh, for this time. That uh, even though many, many years have passed since the establishment of the church. You understand? When the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost, that was about A.D. 33. At the time Peter wrote, that was about A.D. 64. If you subtract 33 from 64, you have 31 years. And after 31 years, Peter the apostle in preaching to the people, in writing to the people, he still mentions the sins, one by one, item by item. And the church of that time, and the congregation of that time, and the people that were listening to him, they didn't say, we have graduated from that. I don't mention anything like that. Drunkenness, parties, ceremony, idolatry, all those things. Who do you think we are? Already we are born again. Already we are sanctified. Already we are baptized in the Holy Ghost. You don't need to mention all those little, little things. A priest, something higher. You need to understand that in every meeting, newcomers are there. In every meeting, unbelievers are there. And in every congregation, sinners are there. And even though you might have been 31 years in the faith, 35 years in the, in the faith, that doesn't mean that because you are there, and because you are not a drunkard anymore, because you are not homosexuals anymore, and because you are not practicing idolatry anymore, that doesn't mean that in that large congregation, where you are, sanctified people, that there is no sinner there that needs to hear about fornication, about idolatry, about adultery, about polygamy, about drunkenness, about parties, about ceremonies, about uh, worshipping the uh, twin uh, idols, about this, about worldliness, about jewelry, about the frontier of the world, about the practices of the world. That you do not need it does not mean that another person does not need it. The church must remain balanced on the word of God and still preach the totality of the word of God even when we talk about salvation, when we talk about restitution, when we talk about righteousness, when we talk about Christian living, when we talk about Christian dressing, that you don't need it doesn't mean there's nobody in the congregation that needs it. Now come back uh, to this uh, section, purity through identification with Christ. Uh, you have seen the way the, the apostle uh, mentioned it, and you have seen what he was saying. 
he was saying that uh, as you know the way we mention uh, the way we mention years we refer to 300 bc that means before christ we refer to a uh, 2000 a.d that means uh, after the year of the lord now uh, there is also a BC in the life of the Christian, and there is an AD in the life of a Christian. BC, before conversion. And that's what he was talking about. He said, no longer to live in this way. All that should be BC in your life, before conversion. You are a drunkard before, homosexual before, and you are a womanizer before, and you are doing this, doing this before. All that should be BC before Christ. There should be an AD in your life after deliverance after your deliverance from sin after your conversion after regeneration after total change there should be an ad in your life after deliverance and the ad should be totally different from the bc of your life and it tells us in romans chapter 6 romans chapter 6 reading there in verse 4 therefore were buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so this is the ad now this is the after conversion after deliverance now even so he also shall work in newness of life totally new entirely new things are different now the things i used to do i do them no more the places i used to go i go there no more and that is the evidence of christ living in your life identification with christ will bring purity and holiness and righteousness in your life in romans chapter 7 verse 4 romans chapter 7 verse 4 wherefore my brethren you also have become dead to the law by the body of christ that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Uh, you have married the Lord now. And because you are married unto the Lord, that marriage shall produce something new. That marriage shall produce new life, holiness, righteousness, purity in your life. That is a mark that now you have met the Lord. And you are identified with the Lord in, in a burial. You are identified with him in resurrection after the suffering so that you are not living a new life it's the same thing paul is emphasizing in ephesians chapter 4. ephesians chapter 4 reading there in verse 17. ephesians 4 17. this i say therefore and testify in the lord that ye is forth from now on from the point of your salvation from your point of being born again from the point of saying that you give your life to the lord henceforth walk not as other gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind and then he tells you how you are to walk it, it continues from verse 22 that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Instead of just reading scripture, reading scripture, you need to read and then you need to stop and you need to meditate and say, my life at this point. If I compare it with my life at this same point, this same time last of last year, can I see any difference? Reading the Bible, studying the Bible, having quiet time, praying to the Lord, asking all these things, coming to the services for one whole year, hearing from preachers, hearing from teachers, studying it myself, as I compare my life at this time, with this time of last year, what difference do I see? A better change do I see? A better transformation do I see? As I compare my life, A.D., after deliverance, after salvation, after conversion, and I compare it with before conversion, what difference do I see? Is there a remarkable difference, a remarkable change? Is there a remarkable transformation that I can say that praise the Lord? I am not what I used to be. Or is it like still before? There is a modification, but still like before. There is a slight difference, but it's still like before. It used to be big lies, but now they are small lies. It used to be terrible hypocrisy, but now it is subtle hypocrisy. It used to be terrible fraud that can land me in the prison, but now it is a moderate fraud 
that uh, a people here, they look at me with the corner of their eyes and say, and you? You see that there is not much difference. What the Lord is saying is that if we have become Christians and we are born again, we compare what it is, what it was before, with what it is now, and there will be a mighty difference in Ephesians chapter 5. Verses 7 and 8. Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 7. Be not ye therefore partakers of them. For ye were sometimes in the past you were. You were sometimes darkness. But now. Those two words. But now. They mark a difference. They mark a dividing line. Now. Ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Therefore, there should, there should be such a remarkable change in our lives if we are truly born again. That is the evidence that we know the Lord. That is the evidence that we are children of God. In Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 7. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them all in past tense. But now, those are the words again, but now. That's a remarkable difference. That's a change. But now, ye also put up all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Lie not, neither by word nor by action. Lie not, neither to your husband or to your wife, neither to your children or your parents, or to your friend or to believers in the church, or even unbelievers lie not one to another. Seeing ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Therefore, we need to understand that the Lord is expecting that if we really know the Lord, there should be a change. There should be a transformation. And the change should not be something we are wondering, is it really a change or there is no change? Now, if there is no change, and we just continue the way we were before. Even though we are professing to know the Lord, what's the danger of that? That brings us to point number three, the peril of identification with the Christless. Who are the Christless? The Gentiles. Who are the Christless? The social lasciviousness and lust, excess of wine and revelings. Who are the Christless? The people that still have their wild parties and intoxications and they still take their hard drugs and with their banqueting. Who are the Christless? They are the people with abominable idolatry. They are the people that are speaking evil. They are the people that are involved in the, in the rioting. It says there is, if you identify with the Christless, there is a danger, there is problem. In First Peter chapter 4 verse 5. Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? Is ready to judge the quick and the dead. For, for this cause, was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Uh, Peter assured the people, he said, there will be judgment. And he's saying that there will be judgment. He even said the judge is at the door. That he is, is not far away if you look at verse 7. But the end of all things is at hand. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, he says in verse 5, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge? Ready to judge the quick and the dead. Uh, that uh, phrase there, the quick and the dead, means the living and the dead. When Christ comes, he will judge those who are alive at that time. And he will also judge eventually those who have died. And at that time, nothing will escape its notice. Nothing will be overlooked. And the judgment will be upon all the works of men. Small things and great things, minute things and big things as well. But then as we talk about uh, the Lord that is ready to judge, you understand from the scriptures that you will give account of yourself. In Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. Here he tells us the certainty of judgment and the certainty that every one of us will be there at that time to be judged for what we have done. Romans chapter 14 verse 12. So then, every one of us 
What does that mean? Exactly what it says. Every one of us, me standing here, you sitting there, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And it's telling us that it's ready, the Lord is ready to judge. And the judgment uh, is going to be very, very soon. And when it comes to judge, uh, how will he judge? And what will he be looking for in Jude verses 14 and 15? Jude verses 14 and 15. And Enoch also, the servant from Adam, prophesied of this, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. The Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Now, as you read the English Bible, you need to understand in the Greek uh, numeral at that time, like we say hundreds and thousands and millions and trillions, the highest uh, unit for them was 10,000. And therefore it says he will just come with myriads of his saints. What was he coming to do in verse 15 to execute judgment? Upon all, all who have done what? And to convince all. Not what all? Who is that referring to? All that are ungodly among them. Of all the ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And then he outlines some of the people that will partake in the judgment. These are the murderers, the murmurers in verse 16. And the complainers walking after their own laws and their mouth speaking grace well in words having men's person in admiration because of gain, because of advantage, because of carnal, human, earthly wealth or profit. And so you understand that uh, the Lord is coming. And when he comes, he's going to bring judgment for all the people that have not repented, all the people that have done evil, and they have not come back to the Lord to say, Lord, I will do that no more. Cleanse me, wash me. And change my life, transform my life so that my AD will be so different, remarkably different from my BC. My new life will be so different from my old life. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he tells us what kind of things will be judged. In Matthew chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. But I say unto you, Christ said, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Do you ever remember that? When you lie against a fellow brother, against a fellow sister. Do you ever remember that? When you gossip and you say something which is not right against your fellow brother, your fellow sister. Do you remember that? When you do something and you converse in the office anywhere you are that every idle word that men shall speak. They shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. That judgment is coming and is fast coming. And when it comes, uh, the judgment will be unbearable for the people that are going to go through that judgment who have not known the Lord, who have not totally given their lives unto the Lord. In James chapter 5, James uh, was telling the people, just as Peter told the people, that judgment was near and the judgment was going to be fierce and the judgment was going to be very soon imminent for them and imminent for everyone. In James chapter 5, reading there in verse 9. Grudge not one against another brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. He said, he just said, uh, the judge will put forth one hand, open the door, and every secret thing that you have done, every evil thing that you have done, everything will come to the open, and the judgment will be done by the Lord himself, because he is seen all. He has known all. He has recorded all. Everything that you have said. Everything that you have done. And you have not uh, put it under the blood of the Lamb. And you have not allowed the power of the Lord. Of his resurrection to change your life. And transform you. And you die in sin. And you die in that condition of being unconverted. Or being a backslider. Everything will come under judgment. In John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, 
they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. It tells us that judgment is coming. And this is the reason why we're preaching the gospel. Please come back uh, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Here is the reason why you are listening to the Bible study. It's not just to come because I'm a member of the church. It's not just to come because I'm a worker. I have a duty in the church. I have to be there. Why it not the fact that uh, I have a duty there? I will not have been there today, but I have something to do. That's not why you came to the Bible study. I have to be there because if I didn't go there, those who didn't see me, they will be asking, Ah, brother, you didn't come. Sister, you didn't come. There is a reason why you are here. The reason is to prepare for the judgment day. Come back to First Peter chapter 4, verse 6. For, for this cause, that is, therefore, for this reason, was the gospel preached also to them that are dead. The gospel was preached to them at that time. But now, they are no more here. It was a time of probation, a time of preparation, a time when they needed to prepare for eternity. The gospel was preached unto them. But life is not forever. You will not be here forever. These people that Peter was talking about, they are now dead. That they might be judged according to men in the flesh. They had the opportunity of hearing the word. So that when the judgment will come, they will be judged according to men in the flesh. And then, but live according to God in the spirit. That is, those who have the chance of listening to the gospel. If they were listening to that gospel and they will live the righteous life, they ought to live. Uh, then there will be no judgment upon them because they have lived according to the word of the Lord, according to the Spirit. What's the conclusion of what we're studying today? The conclusion is, number one, Christ suffered. And then we are to suffer with him. And then that suffering should not only make us to feel well, I'm suffering, and then we're grumbling. We suffer because we identify with him. And that identification with him actually has potentialities in our lives. Not only that it has potentialities in our lives, it's the suffering identification with him that brings purity into our lives. And eventually it's what will make us to escape the judgment of the final day. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, reading there in verse uh, 13 and in verse 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. You've been at the Bible study today. We'll talk about the suffering of Christ for us. About the substitutionary sacrifice for us. And you've heard about the fact that we need to identify with him. Identify with him in suffering. Identify with him in everything. So that we live the life that we need to live a new life following after the life of Christ. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. That's the reason we came. It's the whole duty of man to fear God, to honor God, to reverence God, and to keep his commandments. For God shall bring every work into judgment. And with every secret thing, whether it be good or it be evil. That's why uh, Peter is telling us, see, a lot of time has been wasted already. And a lot of things have gone on in the past. It then he comes on and he says, from now on, henceforth, the rest of your life. And that's why uh, he used, maybe he, he overlooked that, uh, that phrase when he said, the rest of your life. He's saying, whatever happened in the past, whatever you have experienced in the past, whatever sin you committed in the past, whatever weakness manifested in the past, he says, you can put the past under the blood of the Lamb. And you can be forgiven all that you have done. But now for the rest of your life, in First Peter chapter 4 verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh to the loss of men, but to the will of God. Why wouldn't you come to the Lord today and say, Lord, for the rest of my life, I lay down everything before you. I want to act the way Christ will act. Talk the way Christ will talk. Dress the way Christ will dress. Behave the way Christ will behave. Live a Christian life that makes me totally new. New so that it's totally demarcated, separated from my past life. So that the rest of my life will be in the will of God. He can give you the grace to do it. Why don't you rise up and say, I want the present life not to be different from the past. 
I want uh, my new life to be different from my old life. So that the rest of my life, the rest of my life, the rest of my life, it will no more be in the will of the Gentiles, in the loss of the Gentiles, in the desires of the Gentiles, in the deceitful passions of the Gentiles, in the activities of the Gentiles, in the rioting of the Gentiles, in the banqueting of the Gentiles, in the drunkenness of the Gentiles, in the lasciviousness of the Gentiles, in the excess of rioting of the Gentiles, so the rest of my life will not be in the activities of the Gentiles. It will be in the will of God. Why don't you come tonight and surrender your life to the Lord. Give your life to the Lord afresh so that you live the life that is glorifying unto him from now on until you see the Lord face to face.